something that I, you know, really wanted to do and was maybe better at than anything else I do. Like, I think uh, it's one of just kind of like one of my skills. Uh, so it seemed like a natural path from there. Right. Yeah, I think uh, the the incident that you've spoken about, about your sixth grade, I, I'm sure I, every one of us sometime in their school life meet a teacher or someone who is very uh, impactful and we don't realize at that time and in hindsight we realize that that incident has been quite something for us. Yeah, so I, I can relate to that. So another thing that I found very fascinating and intriguing about your writings was and it really stood out for me it was like a theme of the impossibility of uh, communicating through words and through language. It was, I think that is a thread that binds every story of yours. That's what I felt. So, um, and especially uh, like the characters are whimsical, the situations are sort of fantastical and bizarre. And the endings are not neatly tied together at all. And uh, even the protagonists are so engaged in their own minds at times that, uh, I mean, I would like you to comment on uh, what I said. Do you agree with what I have perceived of your stories? Um, yeah, I think it makes sense. Uh, I feel like I've reached this place where I'm also looking at my own work as an outsider because some of it was written so long ago that uh, I'm like a stranger to myself. <laughs> I'm like, I don't uh, remember where exactly the story came from but I can mm -hmm. see uh, how some of my interests have become very clear if you look at all the stories together so definitely like yeah. the difficulty of communicating and kind of you know the attempt to communicate uh, which is probably one reason that a lot of people turn to writing in the first place um, yeah. like when I was younger I think I just found it easier to write something down or, you know, send someone a letter rather than confronting them. That's true. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, it's maybe one reason that people turn to words uh, on, on the page. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that I, again, it's totally what I can relate with. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, one of the um, critical reviews that I was reading, and there was this line that your writings refuse to define, name, confine, or uncomplicate. I think it was such a perfect uh, uh, explanation for the way you write. Uh, so, and in one of your inter interviews, you also said that uh, your writing may not have mass appeal. I think you've also quoted one of your professors saying that if everyone likes your writing, then you're not doing something right. Mm -hmm. So uh, does it matter to you that your readers understand what you're trying to convey or is, I mean, does that, is that something that's on your mind or it doesn't matter? Uh, so I feel like I've been thinking about it differently now with the book out in the world and like hearing from people and uh, kind of seeing the responses uh, because definitely like if you'd asked me a few years ago I would say that uh, you know I'm just gonna write whatever I want to write I'm not gonna think about uh, my reader because maybe like I have two or three people in mind who I know will appreciate my work and that's all I care about but I think uh, because like even within my own family um, you know there have been people who will come to me and say like, okay, I didn't necessarily understand your work. Mm. So it's uh, making me rethink like, what, what do I want to do moving forward? Uh, do I like, who is my audience going to be? Um, and I, so, because I, so I was a master student in gender studies while I was writing some of this. Mm. Um, and that's a particular world where, you know, people uh, kind of write and speak in a more academic con like outside of that context um, mm. and that's definitely something I want to be more conscious of avoiding uh, like I kind of left that world behind and I'm now recovering from it mm. <laughs> so uh, I do think about like uh, that wanting to be accessible but that doesn't mean I want everyone to like my work uh, like Thematically, I think I would still uh, choose to write on the themes that, you know, 
are uh, interesting to me mm-hmm. so it's uh, still about kind of following my own curiosity rather than what other people are interested in so yeah it's a fine balance i think between the in commercial aspect and art as an exp- like it's expressing yourself so and also a lot of what you write i'm sure what 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 you are as a person will seep into your writing as well but you can't avoid that i think yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> oh but i also now i have to like uh, create a separation and i think i it took me a couple of months after the book came out to realize that what people say about my book is not personal whether it's good or bad like i'm a separate yeah. person and my book is separate from me so right now i've figured that out yeah and also the writing as an expression and as a craft would also do you think are different i mean they need to be separated from each other or yeah that's a good point actually because um, i've seen this in different writing workshops where i'm a student uh, you know some teachers approach it as uh, entirely a craft like you know they uh, maybe this is also if you're a graduate student you're older you're doing it professionally so it's not about self expression it's about understanding like the mechanism of how a story works and then you know trying to uh, formulate the best possible story that will appeal to a reader um, but there are people who believe that it's uh, more about just like kind of expressing your emotions and uh, what you produce at the end shouldn't matter as much as the process uh, mm. so i think if yeah like now, if you have publishing in mind you have to start thinking about the craft more but uh, definitely for younger people they should just kind of get into the practice of writing first which is uh, so you know so that they don't get kind of intimidated or um, you know find it unappealing just because it got so many rules sometimes right yeah okay now i want to ask you about like your writing has also been called feminist so and i feel feminism has become a very loaded word now i don't know for some reason so um, like what does feminism stand for you or how do you define it or i mean how do you pers- how do you what do you think of your writing being perceived as a feminist um so this is something i've been thinking about again recently because um so when i first started writing i like i did not think of my writing as feminist but actually people who were reading my work uh, told me that it was and that act got me interested in exploring feminist theory more and like you know reading other feminist writers and trying to understand uh, like first why why was my writing feminist and then also um, if it's being perceived that way then i have to be more sensitive about you know what i'm doing basically to have more control over my stories that was like the process um, and then that's actually what led me to you know do my masters in gender studies uh, but by the time i graduated i was like i stopped calling myself a feminist for a while because i think all those ideas you know were so chaotic and so confusing um, and like there was also in some of those environments there have been periods when there's a lot of infighting so you know like someone who might call themselves a feminist has different ideas about what feminism means uh, and i think that's what that's why i say it's like a loaded word because uh, yeah. there's so many different types of it uh, yeah, and, and i want to know what 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 does it mean for you for me so uh, so yeah <laughs> i think it was much clearer to me before i studied <laughs> it <laughs> then, okay <laughs> <laughs> okay that um, that yeah. can happen yeah 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 so i've kind of started becoming more comfortable uh, going back into what my personal idea of it is and um for me uh, it's uh, like honestly about freedom like of how i want to define myself or live my life um and if 
uh, someone else you know wants to make like whatever choices i want to make a mind to make is basically uh, how i feel about like being a feminist and creating an environment where everyone is able to be in the world you know in that way and i i also feel that your writing is it's very subtle it's not that loud on the face kind of feminism but it's there <laughs> definitely <laughs> so uh so something that might interest readers is the ambiguous nature of your characters sexual orientations and uh, even their motivations are complex and layered we can't put them in boxes or stereotype them in any way at all so and i also think that uh, even the names that you've chosen are so lacking in baggage and reference like it's very neutral kind of names very very different also so was that a conscious decision and does the background in gender studies have an impact on these things uh so, so also i want to bring out some names uh, for the audiences so uh, a chi child character is called kasata and there's one uh, in drawing lessons she's moira so i really like these names uh, i just got stuck to them <laughs> <laughs> um so the story behind moira is funny because um, in bombay at home my neighbor's dog is called myra and he's always yelling like at his dog <laughs> i think i just heard him yelling myra so okay. many times that it seeped into my story as a character name um <laughs> but uh, definitely like when i'm naming a character um, i do try to avoid common names because sometimes i'll also know people with that name and for me itself mm. there's some baggage or like reference like you know if mm. my friend's name is pooja then it's difficult to name a character pooja and uh, write a yeah. totally fictional person so that's sometimes where it comes from and uh, i think sometimes like with kasata um, it's partly because the story itself is playful uh, and partly just the sound of the word is sometimes a consideration when i'm writing so the name can often just come as part of you know the rhythm of a sentence it just uh, what flows naturally in it it goes also for the titles of the stories that you've chosen uh, yeah was, <laughs> very interesting uh, i was thinking about this because i'm actually not good at coming up with titles uh, so i i don't know why it's like my one big weakness which uh, is it a usually, weakness i think it's yeah. it's a strength i felt okay, because i was pretty, <laughs> i don't know how how you have come up with those titles but they're very interesting i think maybe just frustration at not being able to come up with a title <laughs> so the <laughs> easiest word that i can think of that refers to the story in the simplest way uh, becomes the title <laughs> okay okay you have to no i mean you have to really get into the story to understand the reference of the title so it was a good mind exercise <laughs> that's fair yeah <laughs> and and the other thing i i, I asked you was uh, the sexual orientations of your characters and uh, did the background in gender studies uh, i'm sure it must have had some sort of impact um, on the way you that that's an interesting point because i hadn't thought about how the name of the character and their gendering is like you know uh, coming together uh, but now that you mention it i'll i'll go back and think about uh, you know how, how that's happening so recently someone told me that uh, they read one of the stories without uh, knowing like until halfway through the story whether the character was uh, you know a man feline. or a woman it was it yeah. was feline and uh, he he but it was clear for me it wasn't confusing okay but i think so mac so mac yeah. was you know yeah. yeah so uh i hadn't realized that it, it has that effect um mm -hmm. but i guess maybe just uh because the names are so unusual it's 
difficult to um, gender them because some of them are like kasata as a word uh, it sounds feminine but it's actually just a dessert so <laughs> yeah yeah it's, and I, uh, even for feelin i feel because she is a detective and so we basically detectives are mostly in our minds are uh, men i suppose yeah but so with uh with feline so it's a detective story and i did start out writing it because i wanted to write a female detective story hmm. um so it was yeah. uh, definitely in my mind like i wanted to explore writing within that genre and play with the usual gendering but uh, not by hiding it from the reader although that has happened yeah. it's interesting <laughs> uh acha uh i want to know how the idea or the seed for the story germinate and then how do you like catch on hold on to that idea and then translate into a whole story because i felt that there is no linear structure in your stories and uh, there is no big like a clear beginning middle end the, the narrative arc is um, almost not there so what's your writing process like so the idea comes and then you start writing what happens yeah so uh sometimes it it just starts with the first line of the story comes to me as kind of uh, a sentence and then i write it down and kind of uh what, once i start a story i kind of get obsessive in that i have to make sure that i write every day otherwise i have this fear that i'll lose that my like space that's been created in my mind um and you know now i've kind of adjusted to it where like if i pause then i can pick it up later but uh, this used to be a big fear so i start a story and then just every morning kind of wake up earlier than i have to so i have like maybe an hour to alone um just to write the next paragraph or the next page um so i'm pretty slow and sometimes i'll literally wake up and just write a hundred words but uh, luckily with short stories that just means like maybe 30 40 days <laughs> if you write a hundred words every day uh, yeah so so in that way um, i don't plan out the structure of the story i just uh, add to it every day and it kind of um, is an accumulative process which i think comes across in the form of the stories as well sometimes um yeah, yeah. and i think actually early on um i wasn't intentionally writing stories that didn't have a plot i just you know was um writing as a kind of very uh like amateur person and that just was what intuitively came to me um but now i'm more conscious of like how the structure is working and of the fact that you know there's no plot but there have to be other ways that you drive a story forward so if that's you know the voice or kind of bits of information that you reveal slowly across the story um all of those ways to keep a reader engaged throughout very interesting thank you for sharing that uh and i i also heard somewhere that you'd keep a diary or a notebook yeah right? so, so that's <laughs> um i am like super obsessive about that as well like i <laughs> don't feel good if i haven't written in my diary in the morning uh, i think it just clears my head and it um, helps like uh, you know translating things that you're thinking or feeling into language it's just kind of like Uh, I think of it so as this is something that you I'm sorry I interjected uh, uh, this is something that you also struggle with uh, translate the 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 thing that you said that translating uh, emotions and stuff into language um I don't know if I struggle with it uh, necessarily but um I think that like to uh kind of accurately put something into words is all, all, like almost impossible in some ways um and so and just generally part of writing a story or writing a book 
is about having an idea and then you know in your head often ideas are so amazing but like when you try to write it down it doesn't sound that good <laughs> yeah and there's so many ideas you have to yeah. select yeah uh, so i think that's kind of what i mean by like translating that so it has to be as good on the page as it was in your head which like <laughs> Uh, so please talk a little about your growing up years and what kind of influences and experiences or even people and books that have had ha- had an impact on you and uh, as a person that you are and what kind of kid you were and uh, what what were your childhood experiences like uh, so mm-hmm. that's a lot to pack into i know <laughs> what i know <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so like i said i think uh, i was just kind of uh, the, the quiet kid who like to read a lot uh, you know like if my parents took me out i would i would carry a book with me just everywhere uh, and that was like a major part of my early experience so i don't have any siblings i was an only child i think that's part of it like you know you learn to just kind of be alone and um, maybe i don't like create your own world to uh keep yourself engaged um so i yeah so i always love to read um and what else about my childhood experiences uh um, who's been think, your influences yeah. which books which people um so i think like one of my um just general influences or interests in storytelling has to do with the fact that um, like when my family gets together they uh, love to just tell funny stories um, like there are stories that i know will be repeated every single time that we get together as a group um, and that's just i don't know it's just part of the bonding experience um, and maybe that's uh, part of the impulse that you know drove me to write um, and i've also thought about the fact that there are no other writers in my family so in some sense maybe i got lucky that i got to be the one that you know is uh, the writer and so like radio story was inspired by my great grandfather and i you know like i kind of got to be the one that writes that story out into words um, mm-hmm. even though it's totally fictionalized but he was an amateur radio operator like you know uh, during the independence movement um yeah. so it and uh, that was like one of the first stories i wrote and had published um, mm-hmm. so i think it's just part of like uh, being in a family where stories are you know part of the social uh, experience when you're together right and right. uh and then apart from that i think like um, a lot of the writers i loved were writers that my parents had on their bookshelf and they would be like when i was really young they would tell me like you can't these are the books you're not allowed to read they were like on our bookshelf <laughs> so that was uh, arundhati roy was one of them uh-huh. and then papi <laughs> sidwa's ice candy man was one of the books so whenever they like left the house i would go and be like oh, i'm not allowed to read these books <laughs> those are the ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um those were like i guess uh, some of maybe uh, that stage where you start reading grown up books those were some of the authors that i started reading first do you still enjoy arundhati's writing uh yeah yeah i still love it uh, but it's it's so strong and so evocative that uh, like if i read her too much i'll start imitating her accidentally <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think some writers have that effect uh, it's very strong okay uh, so how has it been working with high school students for you and you've taken creative writing workshops with them so i would like to know what uh, like it's the millennial generation and what insights have you gained or what what's been your takeaway or what's been interesting for you interacting with them um so i uh, i used to uh, take creative writing when i was um, a graduate student at ut austin and you know as part of my graduate scholarship we taught undergraduates 
and then more recently i've been working with students kind of on their college essays and i'll my first creative writing classes will actually have happened over the summer but i've been working with some students already uh, on these essays and i think it's interesting um, how much like the process of writing these essays is almost you know them understanding themselves and coming up with the narrative of who they are and how they see themselves and uh, sometimes i feel like uh, my role is almost to get them to understand themselves uh, more than just to be an editor uh, and that's uh, it's it's really nice to see how they kind of you know uh, become comfortable with their writing and almost see that themselves in a new light because they've you know written this essay that's about the journey that they've taken and uh, it's like um, if it's a college essay it's almost one of the most important essays they'll write uh, and that's a, it's a really nice process i think um, but so so you also work with young people in uh, yeah that uh, Uh, i worked uh, with grade 5 6 7 even and i feel children come up with very original ideas yeah and it's very fascinating to in, uh, to be in touch with their those young minds and there's a lot of take away for us and i see it as facil- facilitation more than anything like i don't see it as teaching so yeah uh i i think yeah, at that age uh, it's more like just about kind of uh, creating a space where they can start to take themselves seriously as writers and just explore this thing. yeah yeah so the 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 driving uh, the driving motivating factor is always self exploration in writing yeah. that's nice to know uh if you what to pick up one book uh, one uh, story from your anthology which is your favorite or which you resonate with the most uh, i'd like to know which one would that be um, <laughs> that's tough difficult question uh, i know yeah it's uh, so i realized recently that what this is a, a problem i have where after a couple of years i don't like anything that i've written so whatever is newest that i've written is the thing that i like <laughs> and uh, <laughs> everything else uh, i i don't know why i just uh, don't feel like i can look at it again sometimes but um, <laughs> so so with the book uh, smile please was the story that i wrote most recently <laughs> so that's okay. i think the one that i um, currently still like the most Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, have any of your stories been adapted into screenplays or 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 a or a movie or a film, short uh, film, anything like that? No. Although, if anyone ever wants to do that, I would enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so, which one would do you think uh, would uh, lend itself to a, a theatrical presentation or a film or a screen adaptation most easily? Um. So I. uh i mean smile please is the story i like the most but it would be uh difficult i think uh probably radio story because it's also historical fiction so there's um a lot of production value that could be added by a visual representation of it um, yeah i think your stories are already very uh, rich in visual imagery and oh i it, they contain a lot of engagement with the senses So yeah I agree radio story would be perf it would be fabulous to see that on screen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even drawing lessons would be nice i think oh i hadn't thought about that one because uh, it's written in such a fragmentary manner but uh, you're right because it is like about visual also art. because also i think it doesn't have a very specific time and place reference so it could be set anywhere like on a beach cottage or something like that <laughs> I keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> It's a beautiful story, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so I would like you to um, 
talk a little about your uh, the the work that you're doing right now. I, I've read somewhere that it's the novel is on Franz Kafka. It's based on Franz Kafka, and uh, just uh, if you would like to say. So, so I think what you read was uh, something I said probably in 2012. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I, and it's so funny because that was when my first story was published, and I I never thought I'll get published again or that you know I'll finish a collection. So I thought, what should I put in my bio? And I okay. just wrote something totally random, which I had kind of started to ideate, but it uh, okay. turned into something else completely. Um, okay. So I, I do have a draft of a novel right now, which I'm revising. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm hoping maybe by the second half of this year, you know, it'll be revised and be, I'll be able to send it out two publishers to consider um, and let's see but so that's the next project uh, it, it is a novel it's uh, so the Kafka connection is that it is partly based in Prague which is where Kafka was uh, growing up <laughs> okay um, so would you like to read a few lines from any of your um, um, to end yeah. with so, so uh, this is funny I Currently, uh, don't even have a copy of my book, so I'm reading off my phone. <laughs> um, but I'll I'll that read works. from the first page of um, Luminous uh, because I think you said that it's one of your favorites. So <laughs> it is. I I would <laughs> um, so to give some context, this was actually inspired by uh, something someone told me that apparently there is a group of. Um, linguists or scientists who have been uh, working on uh, on the task of creating things that would be understandable to someone who's like so far in the future that like you know they don't even maybe speak the same languages anymore or have no idea about our world so almost like they're an alien and like that's kind of a challenge that people are actually working on in the world um I grew up in Jaipur and moved to Delhi after completing a master's in linguistics. I graduated top of my class at Jaipur University and was recruited to join the future wreckage committee. There were originally 12 of us in the FWC. Two graduated linguists, environmental scientists, policy specialists, and even an eco-poet. Our task was to gauge the effects of the new light which was still an, in, an intermittent phenomena. We were also to create a document of recommendations and warnings for future generations. My role was to ensure the language of our document remained translatable across centuries. This requirement, along with the poet's inclusion in our committee, felt ominous. One resorts to poetry when all else fails. Um, so that's the first paragraph of Luminous. Uh, and it's, it's, I think, actually the only science fiction story in the collection um, and the last uh, story in the book. Yeah. Okay, so we now open uh, the floor for question and answers for the audiences. So. so if anyone has any questions, they can uh, either type it out on the chat box or they can raise their hand and I will unmute them so that they can ask the question. Um, Okay, so I have a question, Anushka. So you say that you are, you know, sometimes you are very steady with the writing and sometimes very, you know, it's it's an easy, uh, it comes easy to you and so I want to ask like, you know, during the period when you are uh, struggling with um, a slow piece, like you have written a few, few words and a few lines and then there's a big gap. So what do you do in that big gap? Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I would love to hear what other people do as well. Um, uh, but I think maybe that's why writing a diary has helped me. So I, I know that on days when like I can't get any work done, I still kind of written something, even if it's just like uh, two lines about what I did the previous day, uh, just to, I don't know, there's something about it that, that just helps. Um, 
and it's almost like you can't really logically explain it or describe it but right. just okay. and uh, i think maybe also like a pen on paper there's something about that which helps me uh and uh, i've heard a lot of so this sometimes helps me and i've heard other people do this as well where you just you have a space where you always go to write so then when you're stuck or something just being in that particular physical space like maybe your writing nook or whatever you've created um, that kind of tells your your brain then tells you that like okay uh, this is when you have to start writing yeah interesting way so i have a question um, this question is by sania khan and she asks according to you the beauty of mismatch is one of your themes right so can you please elaborate on that a little so i think uh, some of the characters in my stories like when they are talking to each other uh, they like their meanings are mismatched or they you know talking about completely different things even though like you uh they supposed to be talking to each other like in a conversation and uh, i think like there's a, something nice about that indirectness or you know about digression in general uh which i which i like you know some people might think of it as um, misunderstanding or uh, like mismatch um, or even like incompatibility but uh, i think there can be something nice about it so. okay so we have another question purva asks um do you read stories especially stories during the days when you write does it or does it not confuse you so uh that that is a really interesting question uh because like i mentioned arundhati roy someone that uh, is uh, like difficult to read when i'm writing because i'll start imitating her because her style is so powerful uh so what i do is usually i'll consciously choose what i read when i'm writing um uh, so maybe maybe if i'm trying to write a scene where um, i don't know there's like you know a lot of descriptions of nature so i'll okay. go to a writer who does that really well and that way i'm kind of inspired by them so uh himal ask you have mentioned that you have struggled with writing earlier in your school days and now you're such a profound writer what is the major step that has helped you with writing um so i think uh, i don't think there was like a major step that changed me i think i uh, found my audience almost so you know my, because my writing is so i think i, I don't want to say weird but it is uh, you know it's not conventional and so there are certain contexts where that is not necessarily appreciated and school can be one of those contexts sometimes so it's more about uh finding the right form for your work and finding the right environment um so like if, even in screen writing classes that i've taken um my stories are a little less successful just because i'm more interested in language and screen writers are more interested in you know drama uh so it's it, it's more like you know be confident in what you don't kind of find your audience correct so palash ask it's so interesting to have an author write stories ranging from science fiction to historic fiction was this a conscious decision or just a product of themes that are close to your heart um so that's a, that's actually a very good observation because um it it's a combination of both those things uh, so early on probably i was just writing about uh, things that i was interested in and curious about so the first half of the book i would say that's how it came about and then um once i had a publisher interested and they were like you know can you write a few more stories so we have a full collection then i kind of just got interested in experimenting more and told myself okay i'll try to write like one science fiction story one detective story uh, just out of interest <laughs> okay so 
Ankit has a question. I am going to unmute him. Ankit. Ankit. Hello. Uh, you can ask your question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, uh, hi, Anushka. You have studied gender studies, and uh, uh, if we talk about queer people, queer community in India, uh, there is a you know a huge difference uh, in between a uh, general population and queer people. So, if we talk about queer literature, there are not so many people who are into queer literature, and uh, there are not so much uh, stuffs and uh, not so much things on student syllabuses. स्कूल सिलेबस में कुछ नहीं है बहुत ज्यादा ऐसा इफ यू टॉक अबाउट क्वियर स्टफ सो कैन हाउ डू यू थिंक देर इज अज नीड ऑफ थिंग्स दैट वी कैन इंक्लूड इन स्कूल स्टूडेंट सिलेबस एंड स्कूल कॉन्टेंट एंड ऑल्सो कैन वी इवन एक्सपेक्ट एनी थिंग राइट अप्स और इन बुक्स फ्रॉम यू ऑन क्वियर स्टफ एंड क्वियर थिंग्स सो that's an interesting question i guess i'm not uh, currently familiar with you know what texts are on which syllabus uh, but i know that that is uh, often like you know a source of controversy um, so i can't nest like uh, i'm not sure what can, what can or should be added to the syllabus based on just not knowing what's already being taught but definitely mm-hmm. when i was in school I read so few women writers. I think that's part of why I never imagined becoming a writer because I was just not reading that many women in what was prescribed. Um, so you know, even barring queer authors, just generally any kind of diversity sometimes lacking. At least back when I was in school, uh, but that's I think changing. Um, now that you know people are more aware of the importance of diversity of voices um sorry what was the second half of your question i can't remember it, uh, it was like can we expect from you a books and all um on queer um i i'm not uh, sure like i guess i haven't uh, d- defined uh, like the genre that i'm writing within uh, well enough yet to answer that question um but uh, i so in terms of uh, my own like curriculum when i you know uh, design a workshop or something i do definitely keep in mind like that i really want to like you know have my students read a diversity of authors and themes so that is a consideration that i keep in mind thank you okay so purva and ragini both of them they want to know how you deal with writers block <laughs> um i so i i don't uh, experience it as writers block um, i've actually heard th- like uh, something that i read which made sense to me was that it's almost a form of avoidance so instead of being blocked sometimes you find excuses to you know do other things like i'll clean my room or i don't know i'll find like five errands that i need to do instead of writing um, and i think i just reach a point where i have to you know uh, shut everything else down and postpone everything else and like uh, sometimes just not doing anything else forces me to write uh, otherwise yeah. i'm like there's nothing else like yeah so kirti asas women raipur is asking if uh, we can expect any stories based on the pandemic that we have all lived through recently if yes what would be your main thing um so that's such an interesting question i i'm curious to see what other writers also end up doing uh, you know in the years following this um, so because i had started my novel a few years back and um, so through lockdown last year is actually when i like finished the first draft but the story had already been you know decided before lockdown so currently what i'm working on isn't uh, necessarily inspired by it but 
uh, it was written through that period so i'm sure there's some unconscious uh, influence correct so uh, mr vikram thakur asks um so he says it's a wonderful session and he's curious to know is story writing for you a reflection of your thoughts or is there a purpose that you want to achieve through your stories um so there's definitely not a purpose that i want to achieve through my stories uh i in fact i think that's why i try to leave the ending kind of open ended because i feel like sometimes um if the ending of a story is too definitive then it can almost become like your uh, you know posing a kind of moral of the story uh, effect which is not my intention is um, just more about depicting these characters and their worlds um, and kind of uh, more about the story itself correct so are there any questions you can even raise your hand and i'll there upon which uh i'll unmute you or you can chat uh, type your question in the chat box okay so i guess uh, that's a wrap for the q and a session and also a wrap for today's session um i hope you enjoyed the conversation and i would like to take a moment and extend my sincere thanks to prabha khetan foundation for curating these literary and artistic artistic series of events i thank shri simmons limited for their pivotal role in promoting our social literary traditions nationwide and thank you hayat and her current sir your mere presence mean a great deal to us on my front i extend a hearty thanks to anushka for her company this evening and a big thank you to pankhuri for her admirable efforts in moderating this session i must express deep gratitude for our ever interactive and rapt audience each of you are going to receive a copy of principles of prediction so drop in your for address with me anshil kirti or kalpana ma'am on whatsapp today's session has been a real treat until next time hello thank you I'm so much sorry you <laughs> couldn't take my question um okay i guess we can take one more question uh i'll just ask like she's got so many you've got so many awards and if you wanted to be a writer why did you do film production um so i uh, received my first award <laughs> after i finished my degree in film uh mm-hmm. but basically so i took a lot of screenwriting classes when i studied film and that's kind of where i realized that i prefer the writing part of it to the directing or the production part um, but it was kind of a natural extension so uh, why did you choose the colleges you went like austin texas uh, i mean was there any plus in that rather than to study in india or um so i uh, austin texas uh, was kind of just where i ended up uh, because that's where i received funding from so when i applied for my masters um, i applied for funding and uh, i guess they wanted me there uh, so but i was really happy i ended up there because uh, so elizabeth mccracken who's like a wonderful short story writer herself she was my mentor and you know her work is something that i really found inspiring and you know it can sometimes just be about uh, the aesthetics of a particular program and the culture there which you know if it suits you it's uh, it's always a great thing mm-hmm. i've attended so many sessions but i found you so genuine so real uh, very great like great session thank you thank you so much uh, it's been such a pleasure like uh, there were so many lovely questions and it really got me thinking as well so i have a lot to think about after this Uh, thank you sweet. so much. Well, thank you Hemaji for the question. Thank you Anushka for answering the question and thank you for your company today. We really enjoyed the session. So, I guess that's all for today. Bye. Bye.